Today we're going to go into chapter 21 of the book of Revelation. And I'm trusting that every one of us have our Bible. Everybody has his or her Bible by his by side. Because we are getting to the end of the book of uh, Revelation and there's a lot of revelation that the Lord is giving to us. We have to know all these things. It's very important. Because so many of us, you know, we go to church and that is all that we do. You know, I went to church. And we think just by going to church makes you a Christian. Or by sleeping in a garage makes you a car. It doesn't make you a car. You know? No, it doesn't. To be a Christian is knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And walking with him every day. Every day. You know, too often we have been told, once saved, always saved. Eternal security doesn't matter. And so, so many of us live this kind of loose type of Christian life, condoning everything that is being presented by the world, thinking it's okay. But no, being a Christian is departing from sin. We shall see it, Revelation 21. Being a Christian, it entails much. It entails much. We have to make sure that we are indeed free from all the things, all the encumbrances. You know, and that brings us to the, the theme for the year. Awake unto righteousness and sin not. That is what we have here. Awake unto righteousness and sin not. Last week we looked at Revelation 20. And in that chapter we found that an angel came, a mighty angel came down with chains, with a key to the bottom left feet, he arrested Satan, he arrested him, the dragon, and bound him and placed him in the bottomless pit. The, it's a bottomless pit. Now, can you imagine a bottomless pit? Which means that you'll be sinking and sinking and reaching for a place to support yourself and will not find any. I believe so many of us have had dreams like that before, where you find yourself falling and it's like an endless falling. It's got that kind of uh, sensation that you have, a very, a very, a very frightening sensation. And some of us also have had dreams where you, somebody is chasing you, you feel like they are chasing you. You are doing, giving your best, but your best is taking you nowhere. But it's, here is Lucifer. He's been cast into the bottomless pit, and it's a seal placed over him, and the seal with the seal of the angel to ensure that. He doesn't come out, and nobody lets him out. That seal bears the note of authority from the king of kings himself. And he's bound for a thousand years, right there. Okay, he's bound, only to be released after the thousand years. And why is he bound? The saints, the saints are with the Lord in the air, and they are going to be with the Lord for a thousand years. And I have I've contended, I contended that somewhere between chapter 19, chapter 20, chapter 20, that is when you have, you know, the, the what do you call it, the, the tri tribulation is almost over because in my, always our focus should be Matthew 24. Because Matthew 24, Jesus said, and soon after the tribulation, and even that, he said, you have to cut the tribulation short for the elect's sake, for the believer's sake. So believers were there during the tribulation. So granted that tribulation starts today, you and I are here. Nobody, there's no good way, secret capture to deliver us from the tribulation. No, it's not going to be. What is going to happen is that the Lord says, I'll cut the tribulation short for the elect's sake, for the elect's sake. And then the elect will be taken. He said, then the Lord will descend and he will send his angels to the four corners of the world, to the other world, to gather his saints. Now, Paul expounds on it a little bit in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where it says that the dead in Christ shall rise first, and those of us who are alive shall be caught up. Paul was just talking about the same thing that Jesus Christ spoke. It was not a new revelation. It was the same one. He's just breaking it down. So there's no new revelation coming from Paul. He's, everything that Paul spoke were all that Jesus Christ has spoken in Matthew chapter 24, 25. Jesus is just in everyone built on it because the Holy Spirit cannot contradict himself. 
Jesus is the son of God. Jesus knows the mind of his father. Jesus speaks. He said, I say and I do what I see my father do or say. So Jesus told us that he's coming. There's going to be a great tribulation. And midway through the tribulation, that's when you will cut the tribulation short. And so we see here in chapter 20, the tribulation is almost over. We see the woman sitting on the, on the what do you call it, on the, on the many waters, and on the mountain, and that woman happens to be a nation, a superpower. And I said, it could be us. It could be the United States of America. It could be China. We don't know yet. It's not going to be Babylon that has already gone. It cannot be Rome. No, it's, it's a, and if you look at the description in chapter 17, it bears resemblance of us more than any other nation. It talks because of the kind of relationship that we have with the G7. And when you talk about the horns, the seven horns of that beast that the woman was riding, that woman sits upon many waters, that woman sits upon mountains. The mountains are the continents, seven continents we have. And which nation on earth has authority? when they can sanction a nation, sanction a nation, and nobody dares break that sanction. It's us. Which nation has can jump on and say, we are going to declare war. When they declare war, nobody can tell them to stop us. Babylon was doing that many, many years ago, and we do the same thing now. You know, and then we have the G7 who agree with us. Just in February 4th, just this February 4th, we, there was this executive order that was signed by the president that every country that receives aid from us should legalize homosexuality. And then it release funds, sign the ticket of releasing funds, making it available for Planned Parenthood and all those who have performed abortion, something that was banned, but now he releases them all. So we, and then all of the nation buys into it. So they say the woman, is she makes the, uh, the nations drink of the wine of her fornication. We see all these things. It's always good that we look at things and uh, Look at the Bible and then ask God, God, open my eyes to see what this is about. And we see striking resemblances. So we cannot try to shy away from what is the truth. It's there for us to really know the days and times that we are in so we can prepare ourselves. Because, my beloved, we are not too far away from it. Let us not kid ourselves. Jesus Christ said, love not the world. We are in this world, but we are not of the world. We are in this world, but we are not of the world. So we cannot cover up anything that the world does. It has to be exposed. And the Lord shows us those things that we show which can be ready. So we see in chapter 20, Satan is bound. He's the deceiver. He's the one who deceives the kings and the leaders, rulers of the world, to do what they do. It is Satan. He deceives the people to make them think that a man can say that I am not a man, I'm a woman. Satan, he's, he's the one. He's in everything. You know, we look at science and we think science is divine. God gives man the wisdom, but Satan also corrupts it. He pollutes it. So Satan comes and says, yeah, a man, is a, a, a man can claim to be a woman. A woman can claim to be a man. He was born that way. Now, by the way, tell me, which hospital in Greensboro here will not go too far away? where a, ba a woman goes there to give birth. And as soon as the, man, the woman gave birth, the nurse said, hey, baby has been born. A big girl, mama said, what kind of gender? Oh, this baby is gay. Have you seen that before? Where they say, a, a boy, they say, no, he's a gay. Or he's a lesbian, a boy is a lesbian. And no, when the baby is born, they tell you whether it's a male or what? Female, Female. that's all we see. So now you can see the others. So it's, it's important that we be very discerning. It says, as many as, it says, as many as are led by the Spirit. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. And we Christians have to walk after the Holy Spirit and know that the Word of God is inerrant. The Word of God is inerrant. There is no mistake in God's Word. We cannot say if or but. The word of God is absolute truth. It's absolute truth. It cannot be put into any test tube in any lab. 
Philosophers can philosophize what all they want. It does not change God's word. The God's word remains the truth. It is pure, seven times pure and true. That is why you and I can hang our confidence and our hope on it. But how far? Chapter 20, we see Satan is bound and thrown into the bottomless pit, kept there for a thousand years. About a thousand years, he's released. And then he goes to rally all the kings of the earth so that they can go to war. And they surround the city, the beloved city. And then God causes fire to descend from heaven to burn them. We see that in the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, where the Lord tells us that the earth is going to be destroyed, it's going to be melted. It's going to happen. Beloved, it's real. It's not a fable. It's going to happen. So sometimes when I sit back and I look at and I see people throwing their weights around, throwing their weights around, signing executive orders, making pronouncements to make them feel like they are God, there's a day coming. We will, there's a day coming where the king of kings himself, we can throw all the bombs we want, we can release all the nuclear weapons, we can do all those things, but there is only one, one nuclear weapon, and that is the weapon of God. When he drops it on the earth, it's a fire, he will destroy them all. So in whom should you and I put our trust? In the one who is almighty or in the one who is nothing at all? So we've seen what has happened in chapter 20. In chapter 20, they said, Satan, the beast, that beast and the false prophet, they are going to be arrested and thrown into the fire. But that happened in chapter 19. They were thrown into the fire. Then chapter 20, Satan himself also is going to be taken and thrown into the lake of fire. And he will remain there forever in the lake of fire. He will burn forever in the lake of fire, but not die. He will be in the fire. And it says, hell, death and hell are also going to be thrown into the lake of fire. So that leads us into chapter 21. I've just summarized chapter 20. Now in chapter 21, something beautiful happens. And that is where Jesus Christ told us in John chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In my Father's house there are many mansions, if it were experienced, so I will not have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you. So that place that Jesus Christ has gone so many years and is preparing, now is being shown unto John, Revelation chapter 21, the place that Jesus Christ said, I'm going to prepare for you, believers. If you have been born again, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. No, 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 I'm not talking about if you go to church. Because as I said, sleeping in the garage doesn't make you a car. Does it? Does it? No. You may sleep in the workshop. Doesn't make you a, a, a tool in the workshop to be used. No. You may even go to sleep in McDonald's. It doesn't make you a hamburger. Does it? In the same way, you can go to church all you want without Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, does it make you a Christian? I'm just bringing this forth so that you and I, we all examine ourselves every day and ask ourselves, do I really know Jesus and does he know me? Do I know him? If I should die in my sleep tonight, where am I going to spend eternity? They can give you the best funeral service. Presidents will come, everybody will come, give you the best you may get the best pastor who is able to embellish stories and tell everything that you are, which you yourself know that you are not. That does not make you a Christian. It will not prepare you for heaven. Knowing Christ is the, what makes difference. And beloved, as we enter chapter 21, I want you and I to look at it very somberly with our hearts open. It says, and I saw a new heaven when it's a new heaven, it means that old, there's an old heaven which will do what? Pass away. It's then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. That fire burned everything. In fact, the Bible says that the man, the, when, when the, the, the heavens and the earth saw the man, who, the king of kings who sat on the throne, they fled. So the heavens and the earth are passed away. And no, no more sea. No more sea. 
But some people have been saying, oh, look, in heaven, I will be going to the beach. Those, those beach lovers. Thank God for those, all of you. But in heaven, there's no going to be a sea. And not that there's no sea, you can't go to the beach. There will be something better than the, 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 the sea. Amen. He said, I, John, saw the holy city. John said he saw the holy city. Why is John saying that? John is saying this to confirm or to affirm what Jesus Christ said, to prove that what Jesus said is true. That I go to prepare a place for you. There is heaven. It is real. So now John says, I saw it with my naked eye. I saw it. John is in the spirit. Let me clear, clarify that. He said, I saw it. Why he was in the spirit? I saw it with my eyes. I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, not this old Jerusalem. Because some have been praying, well, the, the kingdom is going to restore to Israel, to whatever. No, 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 no. There's going to be a new Jerusalem. The heavenly Jerusalem. The pure Jerusalem. That Jerusalem that is so holy and pure. That Jeru Jerusalem that does righteousness, that fears and reverences the king of kings. It says, and I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, so beautiful, so precious. Jesus has gone to prepare something so special for us, the church, you and I. Granted that we abide in him, faithful. The Lord is giving John a glimpse of this beautiful city called New Jerusalem. New Jerusalem, not the old. I have been to Jerusalem. It's not going to, it's not like this Jerusalem. In that new Jerusalem, there's no going to be broken walls. There will not be wailing walls. There will be none of those things. And for in that new Jerusalem, all those who know Christ, who have come through the blood of Jesus, are going to be there. There's not going to be any, any, any difference. Hallelujah. When I say no difference, all black, white, everyone who has been redeemed, bought, blood washed, will be there. And it says, and I heard a great voice out of heaven. John is talking to us. He said he heard an, a great voice out of heaven. A great voice. Whose voice is that? The voice of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Wow. The new heaven. God's dwelling place. God's dwelling place. It's going to be with us. The tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. In John chapter 14, from verse 21, Jesus said, Those who obey and believe on him and do his will, the Father will love him, them, and he and the Father will come, and they will make their abode in that person. You and I. But now here he is coming. God is physical. His physical presence is going to be amongst his people. There is a day coming. John is telling us by the Spirit that there is it's real. So I pray, don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. Don't let the world beguile you. Don't let all the pleasantries and the dainties and all the promises that are being made, you know, uh, by men cause you to. Have a second thought. Heaven is real. It is prepared for those who love the Lord and who are abiding faithful in him. Beloved, there is a rest coming. There is a rest, R-E-S-T, coming. And that rest can only be found in this new city, new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, where God himself will abide with us. He will dwell with us. His presence alone will be a rest for us from all the senseless wars and all the viruses, the biological warfare that has been waged by humans just for dominance. Those who have the technology can manufacture viruses. Those who have uh, bacteria, whatever, they spray over people's land to create uh, the certification so countries will not be able to grow the agriculture and all those things that are being done in the name of what they will all come to an end that new jerusalem will not have any of that it's coming 
is coming. And God shall wipe away all tears. My beloved, do you go to sleep weeping? Or during the daytime full of tears because of things that are not going right? Or you are weeping because of the moral depravity that our world has been plunged in? You turn every corner and what you see is filled. All that you see is filled. And you are weeping, even for your children, what they are being taught in schools, things that ought not to. Your children are being exposed to all those things and it's causing you to weep and weep. Say, Lord, when? Well, there is a day coming when all these tears will be wiped away because God is going to bring all those things to a screeching halt. There's going to be righteousness, holiness. You will not be dealing with all those kind of things that humans have invented and forced, shoving it down the throat of everybody else to swallow. All those things will come to a screeching halt. The Lord will wipe them all away. And the new heavens, the new earth, there is no good to be LG, LGBTQ, I don't, no, 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 no. We are all going to do the perfect will of God. The will of God. No one is going to say, I have my own, whatever. No, no, nobody is going there with his own agenda. Uh -uh. It is God's agenda. And that is it. And God's agenda begins here on earth. That we have to have Christ in our lives. That we have to be holy. That we have to be awake unto righteousness and see not. And if you are not that way here, don't expect to go to that place. Because that place has no room for those kind of lifestyles. Has no room. Everyone that will go to heaven has to be one that has repented and turned from their wicked ways and surrendered their lives to Christ. Not those who try to, uh, what do you call it, argue out and try to say, no, this is not there, or this was written by something. This is white man's religion. This is, there's nothing like white man's religion in it. It is God's word, and that is it. White man's culture. No, 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 it is God's culture, heavenly culture. The word of God. Everything here is the heavenly culture. Holiness, righteousness, purity, truth. It's here. And it's been unfolded in front of us. It says, and God shall wipe away all tears. All tears. Have you lost loved ones lately? Have you lost loved ones which is causing you to be grieving? My beloved, there is coming a day when all the tears will be wiped away. I thank God he gave me a song. God shall wipe away all tears. The kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdom of our God. And uh, the place we are here. God will wipe away all tears. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death. My beloved, there shall be no more death. There's coming a day when there will be no death. In only one place, heaven. There will be no more death. In heaven, there will be no more what? Death. death. No more death. No more death in heaven. Don't you like that? Where you, your loved ones will be with you forever. Where you'll be in the presence of the Most High God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Where you'll be enjoying the most beautiful music that has ever been sung. I remember that day way back, 1973, 74, at Sunset Tech in Ghana, high school. I was just in high school, boarding school. When these two angels came, one on my one at, the, uh, at my head, and the one at the feet of the, of the bed. That day I was in deep sorrow because I thought I have I've sinned against God and disobeyed His voice because I had a boil on my thigh that uh, the Lord told me, "Don't lie, don't sleep," because He was about to heal it. I was trusting Him for healing because I didn't want to see the doctor to go and cut it. And that night, as after I finished praying, after fasting, I was like, sit, came to sit on the bed. I was so tired. I heard a voice, don't sleep. But I was too tired, so I just put my head on my bed, just about when I was about to sleep. I felt this liquid flowing down my thigh. And when that happened, oh, my, I said, Lord, I have sinned against the Lord. I felt I was so grieving in my spirit. And that was when the Lord sent these angels came. And they sang this sweet 
soothing song they sang the music sank deep into my spirit it's like it was purging all the sorrow maybe I, that that was when the lord gave me the grace the gift of writing songs could be because from that point on i was writing songs all the way from soon Su tech writing songs but that, that song i said lord you should have just let me remember this song, but there are some songs that are not supposed to be. It's reserved for us in heaven. Sweet, beautiful song. I wish I remember that song. I've always been digging, digging, but I still can't. The Lord said, this is not for you here. It's reserved for heaven. My beloved, there is yet a sweet music that we have never heard that will be sung in heaven. Very comforting. Those are songs that when you hear, you say, why? But why am I? Why do I want to be? Why, why did I even worried by self staying on earth when there is a sweet music songs that will not you will even want, don't want to eat you will want to be in the presence of the Lord Moses was on the mount 80 days first 40 days second 40 days no food no water do you know what the music he was enjoying there the music he's so satisfied that he didn't even want he saw Peter and John and uh, James when they were on the mount of Jesus Christ just the glory of God is there. Ah, let us make a tent here. We, don't, we are not going back down there anymore. There's something about the presence of God. And heaven offers that. And we are seeing the picture here, my beloved. Don't, don't you and I just walk this Christian life like a desikali. When I, when I say like a desikali, playing game with God. When God wants, is expecting to see you here, you are there. When God is looking forward for you to do this, you are doing that. Everything that is against God is what you are doing. Well, you are not what you are, whatever you are doing. You think you are, you, it's, it's hurting God, in part, partly, but you are depriving yourself of something so eternal. Let us make sure that our walk with God is so real that we are so transparent because heaven is transparent. Now it says, and God shall wipe away all their tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, no more sorrow. No more crying. Hey, neither shall there be any more pain. No more pain. No more pain. No more pain. Not a, a, a tiny pain. No more. God is going to completely eradicate all of that by his presence. His presence alone will soothe your sorrows, heal your wounds, wipe away all pains, dry your teary eyes. Just the presence of God in heaven. For the former things are passed away. The old things are passed away. My beloved, may it begin now. There is yet heaven that the Lord wants you to experience on earth. There is yet a little bit of heaven that God wants you and I to experience. The joy of the Lord. The joy and the peace of God that passes on understanding that the Lord gives us. It's a foretaste. It's a foretaste of what heaven offers. It's a foretaste of what heaven offers. That joy and the peace that passes along. It's a, it's a foretaste of it. God is just giving us a little bit of it for us to know that heaven is real. And then verse 5 says, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things Behold, I make all things new. Listen, in heaven, there is nothing. There is going to be cancel culture. And the, cancel, the culture that is going to be canceled is a culture of sin. Here, our cancel culture, we want to cancel everything that is righteousness and invent that which is evil and immoral and pervert and swim in it. That is what we do here on earth. But in heaven, the cancel, culture that is going to cancel is a culture of sin. It will cancel. No sin is going to enter that place. That's why in Colossians chapter 3, it says, If you are risen with Christ, set your affection on things on high and not on things on earth. Put to death, mortify, mortify, put to death the things in your flesh. That, that sinful culture has to be what? Canceled. But you have to begin it here, canceling the culture of sin in your life. Awake to righteousness and do what? Sin not. 
canceling the culture of sin, not inventing the culture of sin and canceling the culture of righteousness. That is of, not of God. Say, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. God's word is true and faithful. You can take it to any bank. Hallelujah. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega. It is done. I'm the beginning and the end. I am Jehovah, the King of Kings. Oh, I am the Alpha and Omega. It is done. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit of God, he wants you to know that song. He just gave us this song. Amen. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. <laughs> I will give unto him that is, listen carefully. Let's listen to this carefully. I will give unto him that is a first of the fountain of the water of life freely. In the Beatitudes, Jesus Christ said, Blessed are those who hunger and do what? Thirst after righteousness. My beloved, you and I have to hunger and thirst after righteousness, not hunger and thirst after pizza and water. Hunger and thirst after righteousness, after holiness. And those who hunger and thirst after holiness and after righteousness, God is saying, I will give unto him that is our thirst. Believers who thirst after righteousness. Believers who desire every day after the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, who in the midst of this culture of sin and culture of moral perversion and culture of filth, they desire zealously after the righteousness of God and they thirst after the righteousness of God because I will give them of the water of life. I will give unto them the fountain of the water of life freely. When you go on a fast, I'm talking about individually. When you go on a fast, true fast, seeking after righteousness, always breaking your heart before God, I want to be, look, don't think that God does not hear your cry. He hears you. There is coming a day when all your fasting and your prayer and all those things, seeking to know God, seeking to walk upright, and seeking to keep yourself pure, there's coming a day the Lord says, I will give you of the fountain of life, free of charge. You look back and never miss a bit all the food that you chose not to eat just because you wanted more of the Lord. You will never, never regret having abandoned those meals because that which God is going to give you is going to be more precious. The fountain of life, who is the fountain of life? Jesus Christ himself, the fountain of life, freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. My beloved, in our walk with God, we are supposed to be a people who strive to overcome. We are every second in this life faced with battle. And the battle is between righteousness and unrighteousness, darkness and light. Righteousness. We are in a battle. Paul says that we war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in high places. There is a battle for our souls. So we are in a daily battle, striving against sin. In the book of Hebrews, it says, In your, in your strife against sin, you have not yet, uh, what it, it says, you have not fought to the point of shedding blood. So many of us, we readily and easily just give up. 
and we flow with the world. Try to play it safe, compromising with sin. We lend our eyes and our ears to things that are not of God. And we spend precious time, God's precious time, listening to embellishments and lies and gossips, innuendos and things that are destroying fellow human beings that we think we call it news. <clears throat> we have to overcome. So he that overcomes shall inherit all things. Do you see that? It is some things. All what? Things. You have to overcome to inherit all things. Now, if there is something called once saved, always saved, eternal security, where do I have to overcome? I've been born again. I don't need to. This thing. No, no, but you, you, there is a battle every day. And you and I have to overcome sin. We have to be able to say no to sin and yes to righteousness. We have to be saying no to the flesh. Because the flesh is always domineering, wants everything. The flesh wants food. The flesh wants to be fed fat. The day you say you want to fast, that is when the, 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 the nose becomes highly, highly sensitive. Can smell better than a dog. Can smell something very, very far. The day you want to fight, that way <laughs> your nose can begin to smell things far, far off. And your appetite grows. <laughs> Satan is very crafty. And he works through the flesh. But you and I have to what? Overcome it. He that overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God. And he shall be my what? Son and daughter. Bless the women. The women will say, we have been left out. No. God is not leaving you out. Say, you will be my son and you will be my what? Daughter. But you have to overcome. You have to overcome to be a son of God or a daughter of God. You and I have to overcome. We can't just go through the emotions. We have to overcome. Overcome what? Temptations, trials, and all those things. All to the point of being willing to die for the sake of the, of the gospel. Are you willing? During the days of tribulation, the Bible says that there are people who are going to be required to have a mark of the beast. And that is the only license that you can have to be able to go and buy and sell, do business, and all those things. How many of us will say no? How many of us will be able to go back and say it is written? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How many? The question is up to you and I to answer. But we have to awake unto righteousness and sin not. And this is the time for us to make oppression. Now look at verse 8. Please, look at verse 8. And it's very important. Let us look at verse 8. Say, but the fearful, underline that word, but the fearful. All true scriptures you see, prophets when they are speaking, Ministers, uh, the, the apostles, when they are admonishing the people, even Jesus said, He said, Fear what? Not. There's something about that. He said, Fear not. Be not fearful. Be still and know that I am God. There is something about the fear. The Bible says this it says, Perfect love drives away what? Fear. There is something about fear, and fear can cause you and I. To be driven away, to be turned away from it. It says, but the fearful, but the fearful. COVID-19 has come. There are so many of us. Do you, you know, it's very interesting. I went to well, a store, a store on Battleground. When I go into the place, T-Mobile, when I got there, it's closed. I said, ah, they've been shut down. I said, what happened? They said, uh, one person got COVID-19, so they shut it down. So they shut it down for about two weeks or 30 days. I went back past there. It's open. Open and they've gone back. They're not afraid. It closed, shut down, and they've gone back. But I tell you, there's believers, some churches, people who don't even want to go to church because they're afraid. The store, they are going. 
Walmart is open. The same people will not go to church. You see them at Walmart. We are not fearful when you're going to Walmart or going to Target or going to Costco or going to Home Depot or going to Lowe's or going to McDonald's or all those places. Beggar King. We are not afraid of. But church. <laughs> Even when you are having it outside. <laughs> As if the church is where COVID-19 is manufactured. No, no, this is reality. We'll go to, we'll go to Walmart without thinking what? We'll try, no, not a second. We'll go to Food Lion. We'll go to everywhere but the church. The fearful. Say the fearful and unbelieving. Beloved, this is truth. Truth must be told. So we can examine our, our motives and go through our hearts. If we can go to all those places and we are not afraid. Oh, at Walmart, they sanitize their place. Oh, yeah, is that true? Okay. They spray. Once you are there, they are spraying. There's a helicopter in the Walmart that is spraying, they are spraying killing COVID-19 in the air. <laughs> Say, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable. See the abominable? Look at the abominable things that our I mean, the nations are encouraging. Abominable things. Abominable things which the church also has married and bought into. Abominable things. Abominable lifestyle. Listen, anyone. God does not give us the license to go and harass anybody for it because of a lifestyle. But, but the same God also wants us not to be unequally yoked or to condone that lifestyle. Sin is sin, and we have to rebuke it and correct it. Even if it's a member of your family. Someone was asking, but how about if you say your child is in, oh, I love my child, but I'm not going to condone what? The sin. I'm going to make him know or her know that this is sinful and if you don't repent and turn from it, you are going to go to a place you don't want to be. But so many of us, we cuddle it and we hide behind, oh, that is, God says you have to love. Yeah, God says you should love, but you don't have to love the sin. You don't have to love the sin. You know, in, our, in, in some of the third world countries, most, most, uh, they have this culture, this, uh, what do you call it? Ma a man marrying two, three, four wives. Polygamy. Polygamy. And you see the same people today who are promoting LGBTQI lifestyle. They're the ones who frown. Hey, a man marrying two, three wives. And blah, blah. We frown on that. But we encourage this perverse lifestyle. There's something wrong. There's something wrong. Why do you frown on that and encourage this? Why don't you condemn both? But you see the hypocrisy, the stark and rank hypocrisy. And so many Christians, so many believers, so people call them believers, have bought into this culture. But the Bible is saying the abominable, that which is abominable to God, an abomination. The, pep, the reason why God destroyed a nation, a whole city, this abomination where you had fornication, adultery, and all those moral perverseness going on, along with homosexuality, where these men have to had had all the, the temerity. I mean, they wanted to have this affair with angels. That's how that's how deep they were into this lifestyle. And God said, No, I've had enough. So he had to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And yet here we have. We are even exceeded the sin, the abomination of Sodom and Gomorrah. We have exceeded it. We have exceeded it. So how do we expect God to escape God's judgment? We can't. And the Bible says, but the fearful and the unbelieving, unbelieving, and the abominable and murderous. You hear that? Murderous. Madress of babies, abortion, you call abortion healthcare. We have a way of sanitizing things to make it look 
innocent. It's murder. We glorify it. It's a murderess. And we start with, with abortion. And so the senseless wars that we kill people, uh, this thing, and all the killings that goes on murderess and all these things. Like God says, murderess. Murderess and whoremongers. You see that woman sitting on the water in chapter 17? She was a great whore. She was a great whore, the mother of all whoremongers. That nation. Is a whore among us? Who's a whore among prostitutes? And on and on. Who's a whore? You know, if you're a Christian and you are married, you are so married to the things of this world, you are practicing whore among us. Jesus said that, Beloved, love not the world, neither the things of this world. In the book of 1 John. But whosoever loved the world, the love of God is not in him. As Christians, we are married to God, we are married to Jesus. We are the bride of, the, of Jesus Christ. So when you find yourself loving the things of this world, being married to the world, being carried away by the world, the Bible says the love of God is not in you. You are practicing war. You are not being faithful to your husband, who is the Lord God. So all warmongers and sorcerers, that woman, the whore, she said she made, she made, the world drink of a wine of fornication through her many sorceries. Sorcery. Sorcery. And our world, my beloved, is practicing sorcery. Sorcery. There's a lot that the Lord I would want to say, but I will not. For now. But sorcery. There's a lot of that. We have, what do you call it, skin, skin and bone, that's sorcery. And these are people, high class people, who join these things, where you have a coffin, and a student is put it in, as they initiate you, put it in that thing, skin and bone, a skull and bone. Secret societies, some people call themselves pastors, and they belong to these secret societies. They, they go to practice at midnight, whilst everybody else is asleep. And they have rings on their hands. All this, this is sorcery that's being practiced. And they mix that with the work of God. So they are there and they are calling themselves bishops behind pulpits. Who are you preaching? Christ? That is sorcery. It's saying sorcerers and idolaters. People worship idols. When we talk about idols, immediately we point fingers at Africa or Haiti. But do you know that we have sorcery in all the developed countries too? Worship the dollar, worship the pound sterling, worship all their technologies, and that is all that they, this thing. That's, anything that takes you and I away from God is idolatry. Anything that you, you hold dear to your heart, that you look down, you condemn that which is of God, and you hold dear to the things of this world, that is your idol. And it says, idolaters and all liars. All liars, L-I-A-R-S, all liars. When you talk about lying, lying, we just try to look for someone. No, no, no. Listen to your media. The television set that you sit by and listen to what you call news. How much of it is true? And so many of us spend time listening to the lies and embellishments and all those things. And that is what is in your spirit. It is all liars. We have to examine ourselves and make sure that not a little bit of this lies enter into your spirit. Lie. Who is the father of a lie? Satan. And he works through the media, works through all those things, works through them. People who don't know God and don't care about the God that you and I serve. And so they just spew out anything out of their mouth with no caution. So all liars shall have their part in the lake with burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. There's going to be a first death, which we shall all experience. But there's going to be a second death. The first death, first, uh, Matthew 24, when Jesus said, when he comes, his angels will go and gather, the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
It's only for Christians who shall rise. But those who don't know Christ will not rise at that time. They will not rise at that time. They will rise somewhere here. When death, where the sea and every place will give up the dead. And they shall all, that's when they will rise. And we shall all come before the judgment seat. And then those whose names are not in the book of life, they are going to be condemned to a second death. And in chapter 20, 20 it says, Blessed are those who don't partake in the second death. They will spend eternity with God in heaven. My beloved, it is my prayer that all of us, you and I, being awake unto righteousness and purpose in our hearts, not to sin, we will not partic participate or partake in the second death. We will partake in the death that is common to everybody. But when Christ comes, we shall rise up and be with him. And the second death will be those whose names will not be found in the book of life. It says, let me read it. It says, but the fearful, it says, which burns with fire, they will be cast into the, uh, in the lake of fire, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Who is the wife of the lamb? The church. Those who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and personal Savior. But here he takes him to show him a temple. And he says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem. Remember the new Jerusalem? Holy Jerusalem. Descended out of heaven from God. What did Jesus say? I go to prepare you a place. The place for his bride, us. Heaven. Having the glory of God and her light was like Unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, <laughs> twelve angels to make sure that Pastor Pimpon doesn't keep sneaking. You know, Pastor Pimpon can be sneaky. You know, I go and buy a whole, I said, okay, I'm going to show them. Go to get, I said, you all sell crew. Okra, America, they call it okra. And it will cook. Or oh, oh, no. something very slippery. So I go and boil it, slime it, and then just cover my whole body, make me, so that when you hold me, I'll just, and I'll just slide into heaven. <laughs> it won't work. Hey, it won't work. <laughs> Hallelujah. It won't work. He says, and had a wall, you know, great and high. And had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names were written upon thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. So I said, Pastor, but why is it the name of the children of Israel? Well, they they are the people of promise, okay, the patriarchs, and their names are written there, and also the twelve disciples. They are the pioneers, forerunners, okay. But that doesn't mean that. It's not a place for all the Gentiles, all of us. No, that is a place for all of us. But there's Abraham and all those people. These are patriots. These are the people that the promise came first to. It says the salvation first to the Jew and then to who? The Gentile. See, on the east gates, on the north three gates, and on the three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. On the east three gates, so there's three gates each. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. My beloved, heaven, heaven, heaven is so preciously beautiful and so beautifully precious. It's a place that Jesus Christ promised for you and I. But you cannot just enter in there. And I cannot just enter in there. It is only for those people who are awake unto righteousness and who purpose them not to sin. People who hate sin with a passion, 
who do not condone or compromise with any, any semblance of sin. Paul writes and says that, he says, flee all appearances of what? Of evil. Every appearance, that which appears evil, flee from me. What is he talking about? You can convince yourself that what you are doing is right. But there will be somebody watching you who what you are doing, as far as this concerns, sees that there is evil that you are doing. And so because of that appearance, just the appearance, Joseph was alone with Potiphar's wife. Alone. And she offered him scholarship. But Joseph said, no, I won't take this scholarship. It is, a, it is it, even the very fact that you are even coming close to me and trying to pull on me. If somebody comes, if your husband comes and sees that picture, it is an appearance. And so rather than, instead of staying here alone with you, no, 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 no. I will leave. So he fled. He fled. The woman managed to get a hold of his shirt so he can use that as an evidence. Even the shirt will give an appearance. So when the husband saw the shirt, he said, yeah, you are true. You are right. What you are saying is true. And that led Joseph to put into prison. If the shirt gave that appearance, how much more you, opposite sex, man and woman, not married, what about you in the bank? Have a bag, counting money, and reaching into your bag. Perhaps you're not putting anything in there. It's just that you're reaching for your dollar. But just because of the appearance, somebody may say something. So because of that, you have to shun all appearance. All appearance of you. Don't give anybody the reason to think. That's what he's saying. Paul said. Shun all appearance. There is heaven. It's real. 